Season 2 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. You'll be familiar with what I'm about to read. It's it's a quote from a paragraph from an article by Alex Ross, the classical music critic of The New Yorker. He writes, this is about ten years ago, eight maybe, I hate classical music, not the thing but the name. It traps a tenaciously living art in a theme park of the past. It cancels out the possibility that music in the spirit of Beethoven could still be created today. It banishes into limbo the work of thousands of active composers who have to explain to otherwise well-informed people what it is they do for a living. The phrase is a masterpiece of negative publicity, a tour de force of anti-hype. I wish there were another name. I envy jazz people who speak simply of the music. Some jazz aficionados call their art America's classical music, and I propose a trade. They can have classical. I'll take the music. For at least a century, the music has been captive to a cult of mediocre elitism that tries to manufacture self-esteem by clutching at empty formulas of intellectual superiority. Consider some of the rival names in circulation. Art music, serious music, great music, good music. Yes, the music can be great and serious, but greatness and seriousness are not its defining characteristics. It can be stupid, vulgar, and insane. Music is too personal a medium to support an absolute hierarchy of values. The best music is the music that persuades us there is no other music in the world. I'm sure you've read this essay before. What, what do you think of that sentiment? Um, I absolutely agree with Alex Ross. Um, it would be a lot easier to get people initiated in classical music if it wasn't called classical. <laughs> if only it didn't have the one thing everybody recognizes it by, that one tag. That's a, it's a, that's a steep obstacle then. It really is. Um, there are some people who say, oh, that's okay. I, I can get into that. I'm super cultured. I'm, you know, I, I like to hang with the upper crust, but <laughs> the rest of us don't really want it to be about that. Or I should say a segment of the rest of us don't really want it to be about that. It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, sitting down in Yerba Buena Gardens here in downtown San Francisco with Kerry Willie Bear, who founded the, founded the, I'll call it a community-based classical music appreciation group, Salon 97. And then, as soon as I knew what Salon 97 was about, this Alex Ross essay came, came right to mind. It, it tells me that the sentiment upon which Salon 97 is based must range far and wide to people who don't even know they, they hold it, correct? Um, that's what we're all about, um, really, to just remove all of the pretension surrounding classical music. Just make it a completely safe place where somebody can explore. Um, listen, tell us what their thoughts on the music are, have a glass of wine, talk with others, um, just really have a good time, even if they don't like the music at all. Now, in the same essay, Alex Ross talks about growing up being into classical music, the, the name he hates, before getting into any other music at all. And that was the music he grew up with. And he was shocked to find his peers in college were not also as into the music as he was. In, in other words, he, it was instinctive for him to enjoy this music. And it, it came as a bit, of, a bit of a surprise that it was a struggle for others or, or not even a consideration for others. Did, did you have the same conditions growing up? Um, not completely, but when I was very young, I remember that the only records I heard were those of the, none other than Leon Redbone, <laughs> and then um, some classical music selections that my parents really liked. Um, but then by the time I was in school, I realized that there was a lot more going on musically. So, um, you know, I was listening to popular music as well. Um, far before college, but um, I guess at age three, I thought it was pretty much Leon Redbone and classical music that existed. <laughs> who, were the, who were the composers? The, the, what were the pieces that got you on board early? Um, one of my very favorites ever was um, Shawanda the Bagpiper, and um, my dad would play it on the record player, and I would 
dance to it, which at the time meant skipping in circles around the room, occasionally pirouetting. <laughs> so that, that was um, really my main introduction. I just thought nothing could be better than listening to that piece of music. Hmm. Tell me how the music went, it stayed with you. What was the, the progress of, of you and classical music throughout life, you know, up, up to, from, from that pirouetting, up to the founding of Salon 97? Um, you know, I always really enjoyed it, and by, I would say, fourth or fifth grade, I started to realize that most of the other kids weren't really that into it, um, but I, I always kept on with it. Um, the, at the first opportunity music was offered in public school, I took up an instrument, took up violin in fourth grade. Uh, I was always really into um playing an orchestra and, and stuff like that and it sort of seemed like um, any, anybody who wasn't playing in the orchestra or the band just sort of thought we were dorks which we were but um, <laughs> you know there was just there's just so much more to, to classical music than being dorky so um, I always was looking for a way to show people that it was cool and you know I was always playing in the orchestra and forming my own chamber groups and playing in community orchestras and basically anything I could do and um, after college I started writing music reviews for um, a small blog um, that basically specialized in reviewing up-and-coming indie bands very um, small release albums and I thought you know maybe that would lead to something else that would be more about classical and then I just realized um, one day at South by Southwest Music, um, at a similar in a similar situation, I was at a an industry party, and it was all indie label representatives there. I was having a great time, but every time they look at my badge and saw that, it, because I did work for a classical music organization at that time, they saw the affiliation. They immediately determined there's no way it could be interesting to talk to and went on to the next person. It just happened all afternoon. Are you sure they weren't just afraid of, of exposing their own lack of... I mean, they felt like, they, oh, this is something... She's involved with the music I'm expected to know about culturally, but I, I maybe I don't or I think I don't, so I'd better not reveal that. I better just move on. Um, I would love to think that that's what was going on. Um... It was not the vibe I was getting. Oh, really? Um, because it would sort of go, oh, classical music. Tell me about your book, the next person standing standing next to me. So, uh, you know, that's fine. But really what I think this is about is these, these people just don't realize that it doesn't have to be intimidating. Mm. So two months later, the first listening party happened, and I just sort of did it as, as an experiment. I had ten friends over. I played way too much music, talked way too much about all the music, but luckily I plied them with cookies and wine, so they didn't mind too much. And then I invited them back a few months later, and they came. Mm. So we just kept going from there. Uh, tell me a little bit about, it. for those who don't know what goes on, the the concept of, of basing the, this sort of Salon 97 activity around a, a listening party. How did, how did the listening party become the, the, the vehicle for this? Well, it was something I'd wanted to do back in college as well. I was a music major, and a lot of my friends were not music majors. And I wanted to just have them over to listen to a, a symphony. Um, you know, maybe something by Beethoven, maybe something by Shostakovich, but anything that was really meaty that they could just sit and dig into. Um, I didn't have the space for it where I lived at the time. Um, so the reason I, I did it in the format of a listening party was, A, that was something I'd really wanted to do for years, and B, um, because we're listening to recordings, um, we can listen to um, music for solo instruments, chamber ensembles, full orchestras. Um, we, we listen to a lot of orchestral music. Um, we can curate around a theme, which almost every salon has a theme um, and then we can just really talk about it for as long as we want without um, this need to move on to the rest of the performance we, we can not listen to some of the music we can re-listen to the music we can talk for 20 minutes we can talk for five minutes and there's just no pressure to do things in a certain way 
What are some of the themes that have been of these listening parties? What, what, what themes have, have worked, have generated sort of fruitful discussion or, or tension? As far as tension. Attention. Uh, 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 oh, I said, I, you know, but I'm going to go with that one, too. There's, uh, they, you know, I like, I like yours better. Um, <laughs> if there's been tension, do tell me what themes have created tension, but the ones that have drawn a lot of attention, also, also good. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we've done themes for every season. Um, that has been popular. Another um, attention-grabbing theme would be Halloween. Um, we're, we're actually going to do it again this year, but haven't in about three years. Um, we put together a list of, you know, quote-unquote scary music, turn out the lights, wear costumes, to just have really a traditional Halloween party, but add this component to it. Um, there hasn't been a specific theme that has created tension. Um, it's too bad. <laughs> you know, someday. I'm sure it will happen. <laughs> There have been pieces that half the room liked and half the room didn't, and that would generally be either something that is overly schmaltzy or very, very modern sounding. Too, too schmaltzy or not, small, not schmaltzy enough? Huh? Yeah, people seem to like something down the middle, but then there's there are always people in the room who... It's, it's actually pretty awesome. Everybody will like it, and then somebody will raise their hand and say, I actually didn't like that. I thought it was really boring. Um, and vice versa with the very modern piece. Oh, well, I really liked the modern piece. Um, we listened to Atlas Ecliptic at an event last year that we did with the San Francisco Public Library for their One City, One Book event. Um, and it was um, an outer space themed book. And so this John Cage piece was basically, actually the story of it I love more than anything. Um, he took um, a map of some constellations, a, a star map, um, put his music, uh, his manuscript paper over it, and drew in notes where the stars were. Bright stars were bigger notes that would be played longer. Smaller stars were smaller notes that wouldn't be played as long. And for those who um, don't read music, that's not really how we determine how long a piece is played, but he sort of wrote his own rules. Um, but there were people in the room who thought, oh, gosh, I can't believe you're making me listen to that. And there were people who really were forming their own galaxies in their mind as they were listening to this so it was really cool to hear the discussion um no brawling though <laughs> no brawling. But how important as presumably the leader of these discussions how important is it to get beyond or do you want them to get beyond i liked this i didn't like this uh to get beyond thumbs up or thumbs down uh it does seem there's 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 a vast conversational territory to explore if only you can put that behind you but you've, you've always got to start there right we always have to start there. Um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to have a discussion about a piece in this format where we don't form an opinion first. Um, and there, there are people, sometimes they feel like the jury is out for them on, on a certain piece. But um, most of the time, we are able to get past, I liked it, I didn't like it, and just talk about the piece. Um, people share their imagery. They share their thoughts on the composer's life compared to the piece or what the composer was doing at the time the piece was written and really invoking thought that way um, the conversations can really go in any direction and last for 30 seconds or like I said last for 20 minutes how much how much deliberate thinking do you have to do as far as helping the conversation along beforehand when you're, you're putting these programs together and you're, you're thinking of what might cause some controversy, what, what might generate a reaction. How, how much do you have to... How, how, much, how much is prepared in, in terms of what you think you can get people to talk about, about certain pieces? As far as the pieces themselves, if there was something specific happening in the composer's life when it was written, that, that can be a conversation point. Um, generally at our listening parties a lot of interest is generated from scandal so <laughs> twas ever thus I think <laughs> exactly because then it, it becomes 
you know, in a situation where it's as though we're reading a tabloid. Um, so I always make sure to include the juicy details if there are any. Um, and that can generate a little bit of discussion or at least a good laugh. Um, you know, at least in San Francisco when we do these events, the conversation happens pretty easily. I don't really have to stoke the fire. Um, in New York, I've found that um, a good bit of the time I do have to ask very direct questions to get the conversation going. Not all the time, but it's more likely that I have to work harder. For a New Yorker's opinion? <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I'm not a New Yorker, so maybe the New Yorkers listening to this show can tell me how I can <laughs> better um, lead these discussions. But Maybe they're holding back. Those she's from San Francisco. Don't, don't, don't let loose in the way we would with each other. Right. I, I might have. Uh, I'm sure I didn't intimidate them, but they might fear for my livelihood. <laughs> you mentioned doing events in San Francisco and New York, but tell me how San Francisco, well, how, how when you were coming up with Salon 97 itself, what role San Francisco and, and it being a fertile ground for a listening party driven organization or a cultural organization like yours, and how much that played into it, that you were in a place that would welcome this or was suitable to it, or, or was that not part of your thinking? Honestly, it really wasn't part of my thinking. I was just going to do it anyway. <laughs> so no matter where I was, I was going to find people to come sit in my living room and listen to me talk and listen to this music. Given that, then, it's been an experiment. So what, what have you found about San Francisco as a place to do this? Um... It's been fabulous doing it here. Um, people love coming to our events. Um, a lot of the people who come now, I do not know from anywhere but Salon 97. Um, a lot of people tell me that they feel very welcome and that they love meeting everybody at the parties. Um, I'm, I'm sure that varies a bit. It depends on how social one is. Um, but it's really been an excellent place to do such a thing. And um, we've been collaborating with other entities in, in the area as well. So that's been a lot of fun. How much of Salon 97 is to you about, in, re, I would say, reintroducing the social aspect that other concerts, you know, your indie rock concerts have, but classical music somehow lost along the way. It's, it seems being in a traditional classical music performance, you know, it's, it's socializing is not prioritized and not, not enabled in most cases. How much, how much was making simply the social aspect happen again? Um, how important was that in, in, in the creation of Salon 97? Extremely important. Um, one of the things I advertised from the beginning when I was trying to entice people to come was this is an opportunity for you to come and meet some new people in addition to our program and the food and drink. Um, and there, there actually have been a number of people who have met and become friends at our events, um, met and later found a job through somebody that they met at an event, um, collaborators, all sorts of wonderful things have happened as a result of people just mixing and mingling mm. at our events. So I, I will always want there to be a strong socializing component at our events. I remember reading the availability of alcohol was important because it was so often classical concerts can be dry affair, literally dry, not, not dry as in culturally dry, dry as in, as in beverage dry. <laughs> right. Um, I feel like uh, for, for a lot of people, a good way to be introduced to something that can be intimidating is to hand them a beer <laughs> or a glass of wine or what have you. We don't really do hard alcohol at our events. Um, not that I would say no, we just try to keep it light. Um, but, you know, that also, in addition to that, if they're just really not into the music, if you have a cupcake in one hand and a glass of wine in the other, it can't be that bad. You know, <laughs> you've got something else to focus on. But, you know, it just, I feel like it helps people feel so, okay, this is a low-key affair. Um, I can just, if I'm bored, I'll just occupy myself with 
you know, looking at the pattern on somebody's socks and drinking my wine. And that's great. <laughs> uh, how intimidating is the music itself, really, when you get right down to it? And, and I mean in terms of what people are prepared to hear or what people are trained by the culture or by themselves or by school to parse, to process. Is, is the music itself legitimately difficult for a lot of people to listen to or are they just not in practice in the practice of doing so do they need to be in practice uh, or or is this an issue of purely cultural barriers where they they think that it's difficult i found that the music tends to not be that hard for people to listen to but it really depends on what the selections are if all of the music on a program is very atonal um completely lacking melody for people to grab onto, um, people will get restless generally and, and feel defeated by it. Um, so because of that, we definitely do incorporate that kind of music into our parties, but I always want there to be um, a very easy to listen to, quote unquote, um, piece that is more programmatic, meaning that it depicts something um, for people pretty easily and those pieces always go over very well people have a lot of their own imagery even if I tell them what it was written for um, and then of course I tell them but don't feel that you have to see that when you're listening come up with your own and let's talk about it after and they come up with some really amazing ideas of what's happening in the piece so I would say that generally it, you know, if we're out in the wild, you go up to somebody on the street, is classical music hard to listen to? And they say yes. Um, it's probably because they haven't found a piece that they feel is approachable. And then we, we run into a certain definitional issue here. P people come to Salon 97 events thinking I'm going to hear classical music, but then that... The, the, drawing the borders of that becomes an issue. Their expectations or what you want to include. I mean, some people would say, well, that means I'm going to hear orchestral music composed before 1890. I don't know. But right. you, know, you mentioned the name John Cage. I, I assume he's not absent from the, the other events besides that specific one you mentioned. I mean, he, I'm sure living John Adams, for example, let's, let's name, uh, name a local. Um, I don't, And I don't mean just composers who are more recent than the than the 19th century or still living but how far do the boundaries extend for you and, and does that does does that come into conflict with the sort of broad perception of where classical music begins and ends aesthetically or or chronologically uh, well the classical era is definitely not a consideration um, the classical era including anything before and after are all fair game. Well, you know, we haven't really played anything that's specifically defined as crossover yet. Um, I guess the exception there would be that some people feel that Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue is a classical jazz crossover piece. Um, so we can debate away on that. We have played that a couple times. It was incredibly popular. Um, but we talked about that, how there was this debate over whether this was truly a classical piece or was it a jazz piece or was it somewhere in the middle. I, if somebody makes a good case for a piece that I might not deem classical, um, but they convince me, I'll play it anyway. <laughs> how much crossover is there? I mean, there's, it's done, but how much, how, how much notoriety does, does classical crossover tend to get? I mean, how much, how much hybridization really goes on? It seems like it's almost defined by how little hybridization goes on. At least currently, there's a lot more press for what is being referred to as indie classical. Um, the traditional, I don't even know if this can be called, if classical crossover can be called traditional, but um, my sense is that that was something being discussed more, um, I don't know, I'm going to say five or ten years ago. I could be totally wrong on that, though. Um, what I'm really seeing right now is, like I said, the the indie classical phenomenon. You know, people funding their own projects, um, taking a different approach to classical music, and you know, there can be some crossover in that regard as well. Um, infusing classical with 
other influences. Mm. What are the rich sources of influence with which you can infuse classical music? Have, have people discovered them yet? Is this still a stage of experimentation, or is it is it something that, at least as as a listener, you find uh, is is not preferable to the the uninfused versions? So I'm going to sort of use inspiration and infusion um, interchangeably here. Sure. Um, a lot of composers for hundreds of years have been incredibly inspired by nature and as such their music is infused with nature and what nature gives to them or has given them um, honestly anything can be infused into classical music because pieces are written for all sorts of things they're written in memory of people they're written in celebration of an event they are written um, when something sad happens, they're written uh, for political reasons. They're written because uh, they're actually, there's a lot of instances where pieces are written because the composer has been influenced by another culture's music and the instruments of that culture. So then incorporating those instruments back into the Western classical tradition. So. Um, the short version of the answer would be anything they want. <laughs> it seems like one of the things, one of the facts about about this music import, that's important for somebody to learn when they're approaching it for the first time, or important for them to know is is that, yes, this, this in, infusion, inspiration, this mixture and hybridization is already going on and has been going on within the music for a while. Well, what else... What else is, is important? I mean, what do, you, what do you think people who have stayed away from classical music who are now coming to Salon 97 are considerate? What, what should they know that they just happen not to know about classical music? Well, the first thing I always tell people when they're thinking about approaching it is just go for it. Mm. It's not that bad. Um, just come and listen there will probably be something that you like and there will probably be something that you don't like and that's great um, if you still have questions let's talk about it let's meet for a coffee let's go to a concert together but um, you don't need to be shy about this musical tradition and it seems to me I mean you think of say the indie rock concerts that, that people freely come and go to or go to or come from and Half the time, maybe more, they will say they don't like what the ba- they don't they don't like whatever band is playing or they don't like a song. I think they it doesn't seem to bother the indie rock concert goer whether they whether they like or they, they would prefer to like what they're hearing, but often they don't. It's is it different with classical music? You know, if, if they like it, fine. If they don't like it, then it gets gets really scary. Indie rock they don't like, okay, is one thing, but if it's classical music they don't like, they're, they're it's like their brain deals with it differently, maybe. Um, I honestly think it varies from person to person. Um, every time I go to the symphony, there are people that leave, sometimes even before a piece is over, especially if it's a more modern piece. Um, so as such, these concerts are structured in a certain way so that there's something that is a total crowd pleaser on the bill after this more difficult piece is played. Um, you know, yeah, it, it really, it completely varies. If somebody is gonna, just going to stick it out and keep going, keep the open mind, or if they're just going to shut down. And I think a lot of it depends on their surroundings, how they already feel. And at, at the rock concert, they can say, well, I've got a drink in my hand. My <laughs> friends are here. So it's, it's about more than the music. And it seems like that's the, the way it is for a listening party at Salon 97. It's, it's about the music, but there's, there's more going on there than the music itself, no? Absolutely. Um, I have friends who have come time and time again who only started to actually like any of the music a couple years ago. <laughs> really? It took them a while. It took them a while, but they still came because they wanted to hang out with people and... They knew their friends were going to be there. They knew that I would give them a free glass of wine when they came in the door. and that Might was, be cupcakes. 
absolutely. And that, that was enough for them. So again, everything depends, but yeah, that there is, there is a lot more to our events than just sitting down and listening to a piece. I've heard that a segment of the Salon 97 goers are, they represent this group of, of Bay Area types who, who treat culture going as almost, as almost a competition, like if, if only with themselves, like they're going to get the most culture and the most, the, the, as many cultural events as possible out of the Bay Area, out of San Francisco as they can. I mean, what can you tell me about the, that, that type of person here in, in San Francisco? I don't know how much I have to say about that type of person. I, I know that the Bay Area is very, very culturally rich, and we all feel very lucky for it, those of us who are into arts and culture. Um, and it's just really a treat to be able to um, experience so many different things in one day from, gosh, you know, a cultural festival to... A, a gay pride parade to a classical music event at night. Um, just so many things. So a lot of it is people here like to get out and do things. They like to go out and hang out with their friends, do something new. I don't think it's so much a competition unless, I don't know, maybe some people have, have defined it that way. But You can almost <laughs> make a sport of it in a way. Like yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. It's, it's, it, the, the temptation is there to try to get to as much as possible, is it not? Um, it's very tempting, and then it becomes overwhelming and scary sometimes. Oh, really? So it can. Um, there are days when, especially in the summer, when there are just so many fabulous things happening in a day mm. that it can be nearly impossible to decide which one to go to. And then it just becomes a matter of geography. How much do I want to see it? How much does it cost? How crowded it will it be? What am I doing later? But, Tell me about the experience of, of being a classical music goer in, in San Francisco. And you're particularly well set up symphonically in this city. But what, uh, what, is, what is it like to be a classical enthusiast here? Um, I'd say it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Myself and the other classical music enthusiasts all love to go to the symphony. We love to go to the opera. We love to hear all of the fabulous chamber music concerts that are available um, there seems to be something every day of the week and the, the price range is very large so uh, there is a lot of classical music that is accessible price wise which is a big consideration for a lot of people uh, tell me how you you organize the classical music universe in your mind is it are there periods that specifically that specifically draw you in composers traditions how do you how do you organize for yourself what at any given moment is the most fascinating to you in classical music that's really tough because um, every era and every composer are fascinating in their own way um, I love researching composers um, I give biographical information about each composer at the event, so um, I do tons of research, and I just I'm never tired of it. I really hate to pick favorites too because everybody's so cool. <laughs> yeah, certainly, I, I wouldn't ask for favorite. I mean, that's a good as good a way to get someone to freeze as any is to ask what their favorite is. I can't even. I mean, you know, it's not not really a, a fruitful question. But at at at, at, any, at any given time, there are certain composers whose whose work especially excites you, right? Oh, of course. Um, one of the traditions that I find most fascinating is the French Impressionist era. Um, the feelings that the music evokes, um, what their influences were, it's, it's really quite fascinating to me. Um, I also love hearing about what is inspiring people now um, people that are composing today what what are they including in their pieces what's important to them when they're writing a new piece mm. you know people may hear listeners may hear French impressionists their mind goes straight to the painters uh, so what can you say about 
how that sensibility comes across in musical composition of the French Impressionists. Well, it's true that um, in any era there is there will be definitive parallels to draw between visual art and the music of the time. That would actually be a, a really fun event. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and a fun PhD thesis, I'm certain, as well, but less fun. It'd be a more fun <laughs> event, cupcakes and whatnot. Uh, that would be a fascinating PhD thesis. I'm sure there are many out there who have, um, who have done that, that project. As far as French Impressionist painters and French Impressionist composers, um, there there is a certain sparkle and levity to a lot of the music and a lot of the artwork. And then also at the same time when a piece sounds a little bit more melancholy, um, there is absolutely a comparable painting to go with that. But yeah, one of the ways I would most to find that that music is it's very spring day sit in the park a lot of times who would be some of the composers you would offer to a salon 97 listener to to introduce them to get them to get them to enter the realm of, of the french the french impressionists um well the big two that are most famous are Ravel and Debussy, so I would probably sit them down with um, La Mer, Debussy's La Mer, and just have them dig in. It's a, an incredibly programmatic piece. Um, Debussy, um, his father was a sailor and wanted Debussy to also be um, involved in the craft, and he wasn't, but after knowing that and listening to this piece, it, it makes sense why it sounds the way it does, but it's also not really hokey. Mm. It, it actually really works quite well. You've said a little bit about this before, but how important have you found the, the lives of the composers and telling about the lives of the composers is to, to raising an interest in the music itself? I mean, how... how do, you, do you feel any obligation to, to separate them at, at some point focus only on the music or is it is it all fair game is it you know, the composer's life uh their 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 families their the, the the events that led up to this these pieces i mean is, is it all is it all a single subject to you or at some point must you focus on the music and only the music um the reason i like to focus on including information about their lives interests career um is because it says a lot about what they've created not all the time, but I would say, you know, a good 95% plus, um, it does shed some light on what they created. The reason we discuss this at listening parties, however, is to give the listeners some context. Where did this come from? What was happening when this piece was written? Because there are some in the room who really want to just dig into the music and listen and create their own ideas about it. And there are some who really want to connect the music back to where it originated. So this offers the opportunity for people to have it either way. Now, at a listening party, I mean, is there are there are there murmurings during a piece? Is it dead silence during a piece, and then the conversation happens all condensed into the moments you're not actually listening? What what is how does that work? It's generally very quiet during a piece, unless there is something funny that happens within the piece, and then people will laugh or something scary happens. You know, people react to that. But if it's if it's generally easygoing as far as um, being startled goes, it will be quiet until the piece is over. But people do feel, and this is important, uh, they feel they feel allowed to react to the music at any moment in, in any way they please, correct? Oh, for sure. And um, there, there are people who sit and air conduct the piece while, <laughs> while it's happening, smile, um, tap their feet, close their eyes. Um, you know, it just really depends on how they, they want to absorb the piece. But they, 
I haven't seen people feel as though they have to hide their emotions about it. And often not the case in concert halls, which brings up another passage I want to read from that same Alex Ross essay. And by the way, listeners, you can read it. It's on the New Yorker's website if you just Google, uh, I believe it's called Listen. It's, it's now called Listen to This, which is the name of the book. You can also find it in. It's, it's the first chapter, the introductory chapter of that book of essays. And right now I am scrolling down to a bit of the essay where Alex Ross writes as if he writes about himself as if he's imagining he's just getting into classical music. He is going to, by this point in the uh, by this point in the essay, he's this imaginary self is going to a concert hall, and he says, "It is not a very heroic experience. I feel dispirited from the moment I walk in the hall. My black jeans draw disapproving glances from men who seem to be modeling the Johnny Carson collection. I look around dubiously at the twenty shades of beige in which the hall is decorated. The music starts, and I find it hard to think of Beethoven's detestation of all, that, of all tyranny over the human mind when the man next to me is a dead ringer for my dentist. The assassination sequence in the first movement is less exciting when the musicians have no emotion on their faces. I cough. A thin man reading a dog-eared score glares at me. When the movement is about a minute from ending, an ancient woman creeps slowly up the aisle, a look of enormous dissatisfaction on her face, followed at a few paces by her blank-faced husband. Finally, three grand chords to finish, which the composer obviously intended to set off a roar of applause. I start to clap, but the man with the score glares again. One does not applaud in the midst of greatly great, great music, even if the composer wants one to. Coughing, squirming, whispering, the crowd visibly suppresses its urge to express pleasure. I take it this is not an isolated experience. You've, you've seen this in concert halls? I've seen that, sure. Um, I, try, I try to ignore that situation when, <laughs> when it's happening. Um, there, there is a big push among symphonies around the world to incorporate more young people into their audiences. And in San Francisco, um, it is. It tends to largely still be an older crowd, but there are many young people who go to the symphony from time to time. How did it happen? I guess. Well, what what do you know about how classical music tended the, the process by which it seems to have closed itself off to 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 a certain elite? I mean, what what caused it? You know that there are a lot of factors that play into uh, how this has happened. I I would say that. The main thing is, so there was a time in Mozart's day specifically that um, you didn't sit down to listen to classical music. It it was basically a a party atmosphere. And then in the Victorian era, we all sat down and we never got back up. Why why did we sit down? (laughs) I, I think, you know... We were supposed to listen harder. It was the Victorian era. They had a lot of hang-ups. We needed to focus. We needed to listen, be polite. Um, And I understand it. You know, and honestly, we would miss a lot of what is happening in the music if we were partying while it was being played. So, um, you know, I'm I'm an advocate of of the concert in any style um, where it's more interactive or really we're just sitting and listening but the issue is when you're not allowed to cough you're not allowed to look at your program you're not allowed to um you know interact at all with the music and um you know that can happen across the age groups um there are people of of any generation who will be in both camps there so And having done events in New York and San Francisco, it it seems to me, tell me if this is true or if I'm just stereotyping, but there's a certain energy here you can tap into that is the energy of of a city that knows it can, it knows it can dress down for something no matter what level of culture it's on. I mean, San Francisco has a certain acceptance of all levels of decorum, all levels of casualness versus formality. It's kind of all the same here. I mean, there's not... There's less rigidity in terms of uh, dividing those levels, correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, nobody will, at least I haven't seen anybody, turn their nose up at a concert goer, concert goer wearing jeans mm. and sneakers. I've done it myself, and nobody has given me a hard time for it. 
what is what is it about San Francisco? Is it, is it just a West Coast thing? I mean, I, I I get the sense that the the do do I want to call it openness? What do I want to call it? I mean, I suppose you're the native to this area. I mean, what, how can you how can you describe this this phenomenon? Um, well, you know, you're Californian as as yeah. well. Um, it's generally more relaxed uh, fashion wise. Um, you can go to quite a nice restaurant again in jeans without it being a problem. Um, there's less pressure to get dressed up after five o'clock. Um, and, you know, this is also a, a very lively community um, for the tech industry. And um, it, there, I've, I've heard that at a lot of companies it's actually looked down upon to dress up for work. You should come in in a polo and jeans and sneakers. Right. Don't get too dressy for that meeting because they'll think something's up. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think it's just sort of built in to the culture here. That sense of the tech industry being such a big presence here, if not perhaps the most dominant one, but a large one, it seems like there's... People, a lot, people in San Francisco often had to, had to get here by focusing so specifically on something, whether it be creating tech startups or whatever. They had to become successful, uh, often to the exclusion of certain cultural elements of life. That seems like that gives a, a vast potential population to, to tap and turn on to something like classical music, does it not? Well, I certainly think so. <laughs> um, I, people don't necessarily agree with me. Really? You've had arguments about this? No, not, not necessarily. It's, it's really, um, the, it comes down to the intimidation factor. There's still a lot of intimidation there. There's um, uncertainty concerning whether classical music is cool, and we all need to be cool. <laughs> so <laughs> nothing, nothing more important. Nothing more important than being cool. <laughs> there's the coolness factor, but do you think there's a sense that people who, who have not gone to the symphony or any other classical music events so they, they might think to themselves, oh you know, if only if only I, I think I missed out on, I, maybe I didn't go to school on the day that I that, that taught me what classical music was maybe I think I missed out on something I, there's, there's, there's some, something I should know here I, I, my, I've, I've failed to rise to a cultural expectation there, there's a sense of, not insecurity but that that there is a base of knowledge they somehow didn't get uh, that they that they need to appreciate classical music to the fullest. Do, do you think people have missed out on some um, base of knowledge that they should have gotten, or is it just that's just a perception that, that, that popped up? Um, I think it's really a, a perception. Um, the only reason classical musicians have that base of knowledge is because they've studied it for years and years and years and in many cases um, neglected their social lives to do so <laughs> like like the tech uh, like the tech millionaires <laughs> there you go but the great thing about going to the symphony is you can read about the music in your program a lot of the issue for people is they're intimidated by the price. They're intimidated by the fact that they don't know the names of the composers on the program, the names of the performers. Um, they don't know what to wear. They don't know when to clap. It's just all... Especially that clapping thing. That really bothers people. <laughs> it does. Um, so it's, it's really, I think, the really necessary thing to overcome is that discomfort with not knowing exactly what to do hmm. just buy a ticket go experience it and exactly that chalk it up to experience you like it you hate it no big deal at least you tried it there's that the silicon valley term scale that, that always comes up when you talk to these guys like they whatever you're doing they do ask you how how, how, how do you scale that and i I do wonder with something like Salon 97, getting as many people as possible involved in listening, is, is it a matter of scaling the listening party model? I mean, how do you, how do you expand to, to open up to and include as many listeners as possible with a Salon 97 type operation? 
Well, our parties are pretty small. Um, the max number of attendees would be around 40. We do also live tweet, and there have been instances where people in other cities will listen to the music as we're playing it and follow along and contribute to the discussion. It doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's pretty awesome. Um, Salon 97 also has events periodically in New York and Boston and hoping to expand to other West Coast locations. The thing is that we also have a lot of web content, which is viewed by people all over the world. And that is a really important part of Salon 97's existence, that there is a resource for people no matter where they are. And on the subject of web content, I suppose tell us a little bit about the uh, Mozart doing stuff videos. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the subject had to come up. Oh, uh, I, I guess it did. I actually didn't expect that <laughs> subject. but So um, I've known for a while that it would be a, a smart idea to come up with some sort of video, online video presence for Salon 97. And one day I thought, well, you know, I really don't like being on camera. That's true. This is even a stretch for me. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, gee, you know, if, if I was in some sort of a disguise and it wasn't really me on camera, that would be okay. And that led me to, well, what if I dressed up like, say, Mozart? Mozart really liked to play pool. He really liked beer. He liked punch. He liked to party. It was all good. So maybe I dress up like Mozart. Everybody knows who he is. And I'll do stuff. And there you have it. It's, it's the last word in the, the humanization of the valorized composers, is it not? Pretty much. <laughs> there seems to be that in Salon 97 on their web presence an effort to sort of integrate with as many elements of internet culture as possible. And the sort of, the sort of funny video is one of them. But I mean, you guys are doing podcasts as well. What's, what, what are the... What are the how many ways do you want to to extend the Salon 97 project through the internet? As many ways as possible. Um, we also started Pinterest this year and Tumblr, in addition to the obvious Facebook, Twitter, website scenario. Um, so um, the plan is to just continue adding platforms as makes sense we really do want to reach as many people as possible and i feel like people are going this it's, it's it's a huge social network pinterest i think the third biggest but i meet a lot of people who don't know what it is i'm not sure i know what pinterest is so how what what does something like pinterest what what's what does it offer salon 97 in terms of uh, expressing itself um the most popular board salon 97 has on pinterest is best of composer facial hair. Oh, sure. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, people suggest other composers we should include, too, and there's always a, a goofy comment to go with the photograph, and it's really a lot of fun. Um, we have a few books posted there. I really need to do more on that, but th there are a lot of images about classical music. Um, cartoons, um, there are, you know, actually Kevin found a, a really cool picture of, it was an old, the body of an old piano that had been turned into a bookshelf. So all sorts of really cool things that we can post there and interact with people. Now a listener hears this, they, they look at the Pinterest, they look at the Tumblr, they watch Mozart doing stuff. That, whether they are in San Francisco now or, or coming here, let's, let's say they, they want to get involved in Salon 97, they want to go to a listening party. What, what do they do? What's their easiest way to get tapped in? If they really want to make sure they land at a listening party, they should email me. <laughs> um, my contact info is on the website. Um, all listening parties are announced on our website and on, on Facebook, too, and generally on Twitter. Um, but if they're far away and they want to be a part of it, they can join in on Twitter. Like I said, we live tweet. So they can easily listen to the pieces we are listening to via YouTube, Spotify, what have you, um, without it really costing them a lot of money. And then, of course, they can go and buy it if they like the piece. 
They all fire it up at the same time when they're listening remotely and they can follow the tweets as, as people respond? Yes. Hmm. So no matter where you are, there's really no excuse. You can get involved in some way, right? Absolutely. And with, with, with more to come, I would imagine, especially as regards the, the, the holding of events in other cities. Yes, absolutely. I've been speaking here in Yerba Buena Gardens in downtown San Francisco with Kerry Willebert, who founded Salon 97, the community-based classical music appreciation society. What, what do you call it? I've been calling it that. What, what, do, you, what, do, you, what do you, what, how do you describe it? Uh, that's a fair approximation. Um, when I introduce Salon 97 at events, I refer to it as a San Francisco-based nonprofit, which it is, but it is about community. So, Carrie, well, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks so much for having me. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to everyone who backed this season on Kickstarter. Danny Bolson, Brad and Laramie on Movies, Paul Doyle, Umberto Grant, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Mary Gillander, Eric Graham, Will Graham, John French, Andrew Philippon Jr., Kimberly Hahn, Chris Kay, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Rebecca O'Malley, Michael O'Regan, Gail Poole, Blake Riley, Superfan Giovanni, Aidan Nullman, Adam Schaefer, Rob Schultz, Scott Schenker, Cam Smith, Kevin Smokler, Adam Sutherland, TSD, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.